Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But The Truth. It's January the 8th, 2015. We're going to start out with the headlines from Yahoo.com. And uh, headline number one, Angelina Jolie screams unbroken in Vatican meets Pope. Associated Press, Vatican City. Uh, Angela Jolie has, has met with rock stars, refugees, and royalty. Now she meets the Pope. Article 3, Brent Wadowski, uh, The Year of the Pope. This is from The Hill. One of the most important underreported political breaking news stories of the year was reported by the Catholic News Service in a story deadlined from Vatican City in January 6. 2015. Uh, in that story, Cardinal Petro Parolin, and it goes on. So, uh, Article 5, all religious symbols removed from veterans' memorial after settlement. This is from the Tribune. Um, let's see. Uh, article, about article 9, Christian leader condemns cartoonists after Paris massacre. The New York Post, Bill Donahue knows who is responsible for the massacre at Charlie Hebdo, the, art, the cartoonists themselves. This outspoken Catholic League president put a, etc., 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 uh, let's see, Article 13 is more about Angela Jolie visiting the Pope. Looks like Article 16, how Pope Francis helped liberals, Hoffman and Post. Uh, one of the most important underreported political breaking news stories of the year was reported by Catholic News Services. Once again, the story deadline looks like it's the same uh, article as before. And I think that's, we're going to go now. I want to go to this. I discovered a um, another online magazine called Commonwealth. That's Common and then W-E-A-L. And it is a Catholic online news or, or magazine. And I discovered through Liquid Smooth YouTube channel, Chris there, he, he has been sharing this uh, article from December 19th, 2012 from David Gib- Gibson. And the title of the article is The Catholic Takeover of the U.S. is Almost Complete. Now, I won't waste a lot of time reading this, but I once again strongly suggest that you go look at this at commonwealth.com. I think you're going to discover a lot of interesting information, a wealth of information of what's actually going on in this country, who's actually running this show. So, But I don't want to waste too much of our time now. we got Tom Fress here, and Tom Fress, once again, has generously offered his time, and we he is going to discuss and share with us uh, the consequences of not understanding Daniel's 70th week. And uh, so, uh, once again, Tom... Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate your time, and I'm going to hand it over to you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. It's nice to be here, and and uh, and uh, nice to be with you too, Yerk. And uh, we'll continue now what we began last Thursday, talking about Daniel's 70th week, talking about the 70 weeks of years, 490 years, 70 times 7, equals 490 years, and how Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilled that prophecy perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago. And if you were with us last week, you comprehended that. Uh, I've been told that I explained it in such explicit terms that only a dishonest a dishonest intellect could reject the the truth. 
you know, and you can't very well, uh, you can't very well stand uh, in argument against someone who is intellectually dishonest. But Daniel prayed in repentance for his sins and for the sins of Israel. Seeing that they were in Babylonian captivity, they understood why they were in Babylonian captivity, because they had mixed the holy with the profane. They worshipped Baal on God's holy hill. They corrupted the truth by worshiping uh, according to Babylonian teaching. And when Daniel realized it through the reading of uh, the prophecies and determining that they would be 70 years in Babylonian captivity, he fell on his face and he repented. Sweet repentance. God granted Daniel sweet repentance. And it was music to God's ears. You know that when Daniel distinguished himself as a man who understood the sins, not only of his own sins, but of the sins of his nation, and loved God enough to get on his face and confess those sins and repentance, God rewarded Daniel. And that's what God does to those who are on their knees and on their faces in repentance. He rewards them with the truth. And Daniel received as soon as he began his supplications, God ordered an angel to come and tell Daniel the coming of the Messiah. Gave him a timeline. Seventy weeks from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. Can't get much simpler than that. From the going forth of the command to re- restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince would be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, God divided the first 69 weeks into two periods. First seven weeks and then 62 weeks. There was no gap between the seven weeks, and the 62 weeks. They followed consecutively, just like the sun comes up in the east every morning, sets in the west, the end of the 49th year or the end of the first seven weeks immediately marked the start of the 62 weeks. It's a countdown. And and, and the, the culmination of all this was that the, the, the street and the wall had to be rebuilt and there had to be a government in Israel. And then Messiah would come after the 62 weeks. First there was seven weeks, then 62 weeks, and after the 62 weeks, which literally means after the 69th week, Messiah would come. And he did right on time. And his ministry lasted one week. That's the 70th week. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. How did he do that? By giving up his own life. And in confirmation of the efficacy of his sacrifice, God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And it happened at the very time when the high priest of Israel was to make atonement for the nation of Israel. And we have to know at the very time when Jesus gave up the ghost, the priest was entering the temple to make sacrifice for his nation. But the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. I believe that high priest even witnessed it. And you have to know what horror was struck in the heart of that priest when he stood there in the entrance uh, to the temple and the veil was ripped right before his eyes. It was over. The Holy of Holies was open. Christ's sacrifice was acknowledged by God by ripping the veil of that temple. And when the veil of the temple was ripped ripped from top to bottom, it signified that God did it. And that there's no more sacrifices for sin. The sacrificial system ended never to be done again. 
Because to make any more sacrifices after Christ, the Lamb of God, had been slain would simply be a demonstration of one's rejection of what Christ accomplished on the cross. And we all know, as Daniel even did when he was given this prophecy, <clears throat> that the temple would be destroyed. Not one stone remaining upon the other. Daniel had to conclude that Israel was not going to accept their Messiah, and they didn't. They didn't accept that they had slain their own Messiah. Stephen, three and a half years after the crucifixion, finally convinced the Sanhedrin that they had wickedly slain their own Messiah. And it tore their hearts, and they ripped their clothes. But what did they do then? They stoned Stephen to shut him up. They were not going to fall on their faces like Daniel did on the steps of the Sanhedrin and repent of their sins. No, they stoned Stephen to shut him up. They weren't going to receive Jesus as their Messiah, even after they, they acknowledged that Jesus was their Messiah. You can't get much more intellectually dishonest than that. You can't get much more wicked than that to be finally convinced of your sin and then stone the messenger. But they did. And that ended the calendar, the 490-year calendar. It was complete, every last second of it. And the gospel went to the Gentiles. Seventy times seven shall we forgive our brethren. Again, the, the disciple asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, seventy times seven times. And he was literally speaking of himself. He was literally speaking of Daniel's prophecy right here in Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks, seventy times sevens are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Has Christ's kingdom ever ended since he opened his kingdom? No. Everlasting righteousness. He became sin for us. Now we are as if we had never sinned. Those of us who received him as our lamb, those of us who place our spiritual hands upon his head and confess our sins, they are washed away. Not of the blood of lambs and goats, which could never take away sin, but his precious blood. They are cast as far as the east from the west, never to be mentioned again. But Jerusalem and the Jews, those for which this prophecy was made, for the Jews in Jerusalem, they rejected it. And Certainly, you can understand from God's point of view, if they rejected their lamb and consequently wished to re return to animal sacrifices, to somehow sew up the veil of the temple, which God ripped, and then to let the priests go back to work making sacrifices, the Jewish people making sacrifices. God wouldn't have it. It's either Jesus or the highway. It's either Christ or no way. And so to stop that transgression, God used the prince that shall come, Prince Titus, rather the people of the prince that shall come, the people of Prince Titus to destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
You think God meant business when he said, this is my lamb. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And when the Jews wouldn't hear, hear him, and when the Jews finally stoned Stephen, it, it was apparent to everyone, heaven and earth, that the Jews were rejecting him, their lamb. And naturally, having rejected that perfect lamb, wishing to restore that sacrificial system that could never take away sins, God simply had the whole kit and caboodle wiped off the mountain, destroyed the city and the sanctuary, and not one stone remained among, uh, on top of another. Yes, God meant business. He still means business. God is not going to accept any sacrifices whether it be animal sacrifices on Temple Mount or whether it be the sacrifice of the Mass. God won't have it. Think about it. But they tell us that that 70th week is not finished, that the seal on this prophecy has not been sealed, nor the vision, that it's still open. There's yet something to be accomplished of this prophecy that we know in our heart of hearts was filled completely and perfectly by Christ. What are they trying to tell us? Are they not rejecting the Messiah just like the Jews did? Just like the Jews did to say that this seal, the seal on this prophecy and this vision is not in place? That we've got one week of this prophecy yet to go sometime in the distant future? What are they trying to tell us? They're trying to tell us that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Isn't that what the Jews believe? And isn't that what the Roman Catholic Church believes, despite all their talk about Jesus? They say their piece of bread in the monstrance, their piece of bread at the Mass is Jesus. They call it a sacrifice. You see, Rome, the Vatican, the papacy, and the Jews have something very, very unique in common. Neither believes that Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy. Rome wants to put the emphasis on the papacy. All throughout the Roman Catholic Church history, the, pe the popes have called themselves Jesus hidden under a veil of flesh. Vicar of Christ, which means replacement of the Son of God. I mean, when somebody hears that, the bells ought to just go a ring and ding, 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 ding. Replacement of the Son of God? You've got to be kidding me. Who can replace the Lamb that God provided for us? What man in his delirium would say a piece of bread is Jesus? And the Pope is the vicar, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. But do you know that most of the world believes it? All the religions of the world met in Assisi with Pope John Paul II and accepted him as the supreme religious authority in the world. That's history. We have the Pope scheduled to come to this country in the fall and address Congress. Is he coming just to uh, exchange niceties? Or is he coming to demonstrate his authority over Congress? Look, Rome desperately wants 
this 70th week of Daniel, the one that Jesus fulfilled 2,000 years ago perfectly and completely, he wants to confuse that. He wants that seal that was placed on the vision and the prophecy to be reopened. And he wants to separate the 70th week of Daniel, cut Jesus off, cut off his sacrifice after three and a half years, attack it on the end of time. What do you suppose the Pope has in mind for all that? To propose another Christ. You've got to ask yourself, why are the Protestant churches teaching this future 70th week of Daniel? What do they think is going to happen? Now look, if we're all on the same page, we all understand this prophecy is over. It was over 2,000 years ago. Christ came. The Jews rejected him. The temple was destroyed. The city and the sanctuary were destroyed. The Jews were scattered amongst the nations. Why? Because that's where the gospel went. God wanted him to hear the gospel again, not to stay in Jerusalem and keep making animal sacrifices that couldn't wash away sins. No, the only, where they, the only place they were ever going to hear about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the one who confirmed a covenant in his blood for one week and then in the midst of the week caused the sacrifice and oblations to cease by giving up his own life, shedding his own blood, the only way they were going to hear about him was in the Gentile nations. Not in Jerusalem. It was an act of mercy to scatter them. Because if he left them in Israel, in Jerusalem, the Jews would still want to make animal sacrifices, just like they do today. Gersh and Solomon traipsing around making animal sacrifices which cannot wash away sin, which God will not accept. So he scattered them among the nations so that they would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul commanded us, don't boast against those Jews. We're to provoke them to jealousy for their own Messiah, the one they slew during the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. So, what do they propose to do by saying that the 70th week, Jesus' week, the Messiah's week, is tacked off and put on the end of time? It can only be to deceive the whole world. And if you've attended any of the churches that I've attended in my lifetime, you know the deception. They all believe it. The 70th week of Daniel, that's what they call it. Or the time of Jacob's trouble. Or seven years of great tribulation. Where do you suppose they get this seven years from? They get it right here in Daniel's prophecy. After the 69th week came <clears throat> one week, a seven-year period of time. Jesus saved us from our sins during that week. But they call it the time of Jacob's trouble. So that wasn't my trouble. That was my salvation. The 70th week of Daniel was my salvation. Jesus was my Messiah. And they call a seven-year period of time, at the end of time, the time of Jacob's trouble. You know who Jacob was? Jacob was the one who wrestled with God. I won't let you go until you bless me. He wanted to be in Christ's kingdom so bad he would wrestle with the angel of the Lord. Nothing was more important to Jacob than to be a part of God's heavenly kingdom. I think it's time for more of those who are talking about the time of Jacob's trouble to have that wrestling match with the Lord. And when they do, you know what they're going to find out? 
the seventieth week's over. Just like God gave it to Daniel. Just like we receive it when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and begin to question who it is that would confuse us and for what purpose. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. This is essentially Daniel's 70th week. Let me read it for you. If you have your Bible in front of you, please open it to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Read right along with me to confirm that I am not doing any violence to these scriptures. First, I'm going to read it through without comment, and then I'm going to show you how they're deceiving you. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined, shall be poured upon the desolate. That's what happened 2,000 years ago. He, Jesus Christ, confirmed the covenant, that is, the covenant in his blood. He confirmed it for all who would receive it for one week, a seven-year period of time, the 70th week of Daniel. Look. It's in this prophecy. It's either talking about seven weeks, 49 years, or 62 weeks, being 69 altogether, or one week. <clears throat> he confirmed that covenant for, with many for one week. How do you confirm a covenant? You simply perform it. And Jesus did gave up his life in the midst of the week. It says, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. He confirmed the covenant by shedding his own blood. That's the covenant in his blood. Anybody could see the blood. He was crucified publicly in shame. There was the blood covenant, and by doing that he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. They ceased when the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. And for the overspreading of abominations, what are abominations? False sacrifices. That means the sacrifices in the temple were, were continued after Jesus was crucified. And he said, for the overspreading of abominations... He shall make it desolate. What did he say? Your house is left unto you desolate. I'm not going to accept any more sacrifices. They are abominations. You've rejected Jesus, the supreme sacrifice, the one that God gave you to return to animal sacrifices. But God made the temple desolate even until the consummation. What's the consummation? Well, that word's used before in other other places in the Bible that indicate the end of time. Now, I know some people will argue with this, and you can argue till the cows come home. Whether you think the word consummation in this case means to the tells Christ's second coming, or you believe the consummation referred to here is the uh, the consummation of the war that took place in 70 A.D. where the city and the sanctuary were destroyed, have it either way. But I'm here to tell you the Spirit of God will bear witness. 
that Jesus was the Lamb. And God won't accept any more lambs and goats. Take it to the bank. He won't accept lambs and goats any more than he, than he will accept the sacrifice of the mass. They are abominations. And he concludes by saying, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That determined. The 70 weeks shall be poured upon the desolate. This prophecy had to do with the Jews and Jerusalem, Daniel's people and the holy city and the Messiah. It doesn't talk about anything else except for a brief clause in verse 26 where it says, and the people of the prince that shall come. We've determined that to be Prince Titus, the son of the reigning Caesar at the time, Vespasian, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It was a great army, Roman 10th Legion. Prince Titus was the, the general of that 10th Legion, and he brought hordes of people with him, and they destroyed the city and the sanctuary, overturning all the stones of the steps, uh, all the stones of the, of the temple which they had burnt, and Josephus records that the flame was so hot that it, that it melted the gold in the temple, and the gold had liquefied under the heat and had melted, and, and, and uh, uh, capillary action or some other uh, method, the gold had leached into the, the joints between the rocks. And to recover the gold, you know, they were conquering Jerusalem. They were taking the booty, and they didn't want to leave the gold behind, so they overturned all the stones of the temple, literally leveled it to retrieve all the gold, the molten gold, picking it off the rocks and putting it in bags and calling it back to Rome as bounty, booty for the war, to pay for the war effort. That's what happened. It's all fulfilled. To say the 70th week of Daniel is over is to deny that the Messiah has come. To deny that animal sacrifices and oblations had, had ceased. And what are they teaching today? That there will be a seven-year period of time. Look, look, what they're really doing is refulfilling the 70th week of Daniel. They say the seal on the prophecy and the vision is not sealed. It's still open. The 70th week of Daniel never occurred in history, so it's going to happen in the future. And guess what? In order to, to convincingly re-fulfill this prophecy, which God fulfilled in history 2,000 years ago, which Jesus fulfilled 2,000 years ago, guess what? There has to be involved a covenant for one week, for seven years. And in the midst of the week, after three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Well, if he's going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, then they must have started, right? Right? And they've been in operation for three and a half years. And in the midst of the week, he, whoever that is, is going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And all of this presumes that there's going to be a nation of Israel again in the world after 70 A.D., and that there's going to be a need for a sacrifice. Where does that need come from? Well, the Jews, having rejected Jesus, need their sacrifice, don't they? Wasn't that the abomination that they were trying to conduct after the veil of the temple was rent? They want to continue that abomination.
So there has to be Jews living in the land of Israel. And where do you conduct sacrifices and oblations? In the temple, on Temple Mount. Remember, if, they, if, if, if whoever it is that wants a redo, a do-over of the 70th week of Daniel, if they don't do it in Israel, if they don't do it on Temple Mount, if there's not Jews living in the land and there's not a temple built, who's it going to convince? Look, if you're going to counterfeit something, you're going to counterfeit a dollar bill, you better make it convincing or nobody's going to accept it, right? Nobody's going to be fooled. Nobody's going to be deceived. But the Bible says he is going to deceive the whole world. Now do you see why they're teaching it in virtually all the churches? There has to be an Israel. There has to be Jews living in the land. There has to be a temple. There has to be a seven-year covenant. There has to be animal sacrifices and oblations. It has to be on Temple Mount, in a temple. And then after three and a half years, he, whoever that is, is going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And isn't that what the world is prepared to do? Isn't that what the world has been preparing for close to, what now, 250 years? I mean, look, the Vatican and the Jews want a do-over of the 70th week of Daniel. God destroyed the city and the sanctuary through many people of Prince Titus, scattered the Jews throughout the world. They couldn't do a do-over with that Israel because God destroyed it. So they got to make their own Israel. Stop and think what is required to take place for a phony 70th week of Daniel to be accomplished. First, you have to create a nation-state of Israel. Then you have to have Jews living in the land. How do you make the Jews go back to this new nation-state of Israel? By persecution. By the Holocaust. By anti-Semitism. Do you realize the Roman Catholic Church has had a doctrine almost from the get-go called replacement theology? That the Jews are Christ killers and are worthy of damnation, and that God simply took the, the, the title chosen people away from the Jews, and guess where he put it? Right on the Roman Catholic Church. That's right. Rome teaches the Roman Catholic Church has replaced the Jews, that they are God's chosen people. They have a divine right to rule the world. They have a divine right to make you Catholic. They have a divine right to rule all the nations of the world, all the governments of the world. That's exactly what happened in the old world order. Nobody can dispute that. History is copiously uh, in support of that truth. The Vatican governed all the kings of the earth. He sat and unseated kings. He crowned and uncrowned the kings of, of Europe. And if he wants a do-over of the 70th week of Daniel, then he's got to create a nation-state of Israel, doesn't he? The Bible also talks about wars, wars, and rumors of wars. You know how the Vatican got his nation-state of Israel in 1948? Wars, wars, and rumors of wars. First, a world, the First World War to destroy Protestants, Bible-believing Protestants and Jews that knew the Scriptures. 
Did you know that there were many of the Jews that were scattered among Europe, uh, scattered among Europe realized that they had no right to return to their land, which was not a land at all? They had no right to re- re- return to Israel until God delivered them to Israel, just like he delivered them out of Pharaoh's Egypt to Israel. By the Shekinah glory, by a a Jewish Moses, by God's stretched out arm. And you note the Pope, the Antichrist, the vicar of Christ, the self-styled vicar of Christ, if he needs a phony redo of Daniel's 70th week, he's got to have an Israel, and he's got to have Jews living in the land. So he created Israel with the help of the nations, with the help of the governments of the nations, particularly England. Winston Churchill, General Allenby, and he even had some help from uh, a wayward Jew by the name of Theodore Herzl. And he had Lord Balfour, a Satanist, who said, a people without a land and a land without a people. So the movement got started in Rome's Europe, in Papal Europe. you got to have a stage to perform this phony reenactment of God's 70th week of Daniel, and it's got to be in the ancient land of Israel on the, on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And you got to have Jews living in the land. What good's a covenant? What good's animal sacrifices if there's no Jews living in the land? And what about all the Jews in Europe that said that they can't go back to Israel until God leads them there with the Shekinah glory, with his outstretched arm? They have to be destroyed, don't they? Otherwise, they may corrupt the rest of the Jews that are willing to go back down to Israel to help perform this phony futurist counterfeit 70th week of Daniel. There's your Holocaust. There's World War II. And Yerk, who's listening, and Michael both know that the Nazis could not have happened without the Vatican support. They know that Hitler was a devout Roman Catholic all his life. He, they know that the SS, the, 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 the Gestapo, the SS, the secret service of, of the Nazi Germans, were literally fashioned after the Jesuit order. That Himmler was nothing but Germany's Ignatius Loyola. And what did they do? They killed Protestants and Orthodox, and Jews, all three of which Rome considers heretical, heretics. It was just another inquisition. But it accomplished not only the killing of Protestants and Orthodox, but it killed Jews who would never return to Israel but by God's outstretched hand. And once they were all gone, then Rome and the government of England and other governments of the world created this League of Nations. League of Nations, which was the forerunner of the United Nations that now governs the world for the Pope. But in the meantime... Israel was established. In one day, it became a nation. And guess who was the first one to acknowledge it? The United States of America, a Protestant land that should understand the fulfillment of Daniel 9.27. But guess what? They've been taught lies. The, the 70th week of Daniel's detached, put on the end of time. It's, it hasn't happened yet. So they have to help make it happen, don't they? So they first acknowledged the new nation state of Israel. 
the United States was the first nation on the planet that acknowledged the new nation state of Israel in 1947. But guess who it's created to help? The Vatican. And guess who remained aloof? And still remains aloof? The Vatican. The papacy. You know, it's customary among royalty that when they get a big party together, when the queen's going to have a party, Invite all the princes and 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 uh, the uh, the pretty people from the nation to come and to have a party. The queen is always stylishly late to her own party. That's how I describe the Vatican's apparent rejection of the new nation state of Israel. It's her creation to begin with. It's her party. She's just stylishly late. So we have a new nation state of Israel. We have Jews now living in the land, having after silenced all those Jews who said, we can't go back to our land till God leads us. We have the persecution that drove them there, replacement theology, anti-Semitism, or rather anti-Jew hatred. We have the Holocaust and Jewish persecution. Now we've got a nation and Jews living in the land. We're almost there. We've we've got the stage and we've got the actors on the stage for our phony, futurist, counterfeit, diabolical 70th week of Daniel where we are going to provide the world a phony Christ. And all the talk in all the churches about, oh, bless God is filling the land with Jews. We've got to help the Jews make Aliyah to Israel. We've got to, oh, all they're, they're, they're getting the priesthood all trained. We're told that they've got all the articles of the temple refashioned of gold, just like the Bible describes them. We've got the priest vestments all done up and ready to go. All they lack is a priest to go in them. We found the ashes of the red heifer. We found a spotless red heifer with which we can make the ashes to to sanctify the temple. All we need is a temple. We've got everything else. All we need is a temple. And what's it going to take to get that temple? They say they've got the stones already cut without making any noise at all. All they've got to do is just pick up those stones, carry them to the top of the mountain, erect them on top of one another, and first thing you know, there's a temple standing there. They could do it in days. And begin animal sacrifices again. Of course, there's no, you know, there's no need for a temple if you're not going to make animal sacrifices. They got the whole Christian world also prayerfully looking forward to the day when the Jews build their temple and begin animal sacrifices to eat and drink damnation to themselves, to continue the abominations that they tried to continue after rejecting their lamb during the real 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. You see what's really happening? Once that temple is established, after a seven-year peace treaty has been signed between... The governing authority and the Jewish people, they get to begin their animal sacrifices for three and a half years. But after three and a half years, somebody's going to cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease. Who will that be? Anybody can answer that question. It's not a trick question. Who, according to the Christian churches, according to the beliefs of virtually every Christian on this planet, who is going to cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease? Why, the Antichrist, 
Only the Antichrist would cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease. So whoever that is that signs a peace treaty with the Jews, a seven-year peace treaty, allows the Jews to build a temple, begin animal sacrifices, and that for three and a half years causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, they will regard that man as the Antichrist, and there you won't be able to convince them otherwise. No matter what you do, you will never be able to convince them otherwise. Only the Spirit of Almighty God can wake them up to the reality that the entire 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And once they believe that whoever this is, it could be Mickey Mouse who signs a peace treaty with the Jews for seven years, allows them to build a temple, begins animal sacrifices again, in the midst of the week, after three and a half years, causes those sacrifices and oblations to cease, well, then Mickey Mouse will be the Antichrist. And you won't be able to convince anybody otherwise. And if they put up a man, not Mickey Mouse, they're not that stupid. But they pick a man distinguished, like Rampy of Europe, or... Javier Solana, Savior Solana, that's what his first name means, don't you know? Javier means Savior in Spanish. Javier Solana is reported to have a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews all ready to go. It's already been written. Is he going to be the Antichrist? I don't know. But I guarantee you, since I know the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And it was Jesus who made the covenant and fulfilled it with his own blood. I'm not going to be fooled by anybody who signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. Anybody who signs a peace treaty with the Jews to cause them to build a temple and eat and eat and drink damnation to themselves has got to be the Antichrist, right? But I propose that whoever signs that peace treaty with the Jews and then cancels it after three and a half years is only going to be put up to be the counterfeit Antichrist and who, what Rome intends to do after that is to present the papacy as the Christ. There's your counterfeit. That's what this is all about. To finally, convincingly, after having rejected the real fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, to set a world stage to conduct a counterfeit 70th week is all for the purpose of denying that Jesus was the Christ and that there's somebody else that's going to save the Jews and the rest of the world from nuclear annihilation. And guess who that is? The papacy. That's the role the papacy has been playing since their reestablishment in 1929 at the Lateran Accords to be the world harbinger of peace the ecumenical movement to unite all the world, religions of the world, all the governments of the world into a one-world religion, a one-world government, and a global kumbaya for Satan. The papacy's been the bell ringer for that for, for decades and decades and decades. And, of course, he's always claimed himself to be the replacement of the Son of God, which miraculously diabolically is believed by most of the world. You know who the replacement of the Son of God was? Fifty days after Jesus departed, the Holy Spirit was sent. That's the replacement of the Son of God, his own spirit. And guess what? 
If you call yourself, if any man on the planet calls himself the replacement of the Son of God, he has claimed the office of the Holy Spirit. He has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. That's how you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You claim to be the Holy Spirit. You claim to be the vicar or the replacement of the Son of God. That's who the Antichrist is. And I'm going to conclude with this. If there's any doubt in your mind how this 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled and when and by whom, you stand in dire jeopardy of believing a lie. and receiving a false Christ. Remember the consequences that were experienced by Israel, by Jerusalem and the Jews, for not understanding Daniel's 70th week. They knew not the time of their visitation. And guess what the consequences will be for Christians in the world today who likewise do not understand the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week and look for a future one. They will receive a false Christ. If you have any questions about this, Write me, tom at seawaves.us, tom at seawaves, S-E-A-W-A-V-E-S, just like waves of the sea, S-E-A-W-A-V-E-S dot U-S. And I'll have the patience of Job. There are no such thing as stupid questions when it comes to Daniel's 70th week. No such thing. But I will tell you, to get an answer from me about the 70th week of Daniel, about anything I've said in this program tonight, you have to at least be intellectually honest. What are the consequences of the Jews who did not know the, tr- the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. They knew not the time of their visitation. They rejected Jesus Christ. They were scattered. Their temple was destroyed, and their city was destroyed, and they ceased to be a people. What is going to happen? For the Christians of the world today, deceived by the papacy into believing there must be a future 70th week of Daniel, they will have likewise disastrous consequences in receiving a false Christ, the papacy. Back to you, Michael. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom, for that. That was excellent. And, uh, you know, I do have some questions. If you would like to uh, arm you uh, in dealing with them. Uh, uh, I accept everything that's been said today. It's It's clear. It's obvious. It's true. But the questions I have are relevant in, to the sense of, uh, why there's so much confusion about Daniel 9:27, and uh, inevitably, what's going to people go to is Revelations 2:9 about the synagogue of Satan. And there's an awful lot of people out there in the world that believe that the Jews are running the show. It's not Rome, and um, I would like us to address a little bit about that. Um, who, what is the synagogue of Satan? And obviously the Jews do not run the show at the papacy, and the Jesuits are the ones who created the state of Israel and are 
playing out this phony counterfeit uh, of Daniel 9, 27. Um, so I don't know if you're willing to talk about this or not right now. Uh, I feel that it's relevant. Who is the synagogue of Satan in, in Revelation 9, or 2, 9? The synagogue of the synagogue of Satan is 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 Roman and Jew alike. If they do not accept Jesus as the Messiah, as prophesied by Daniel in the seventy seventy weeks of Daniel, and look for another, that is the synagogue of Satan. Look, there's only one Church of Christ. Okay. Yeah. And and and. Jesus is the rock and foundation and cornerstone of that church, and we are all little stones built upon it. Amen. It's the body of Christ. And the synagogue of Satan is everything else. Now, I know there's a vast body of... of, of of people, most of whom are Roman Catholic, or at least influenced by anti-Semitism or anti, more correctly, anti-Jewish hatred, who are influenced by replacement theology that the that the Jews are have rejected Christ, they're Christ killers, and that the 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 moniker. Of, of the chosen people has gone to someone else, but most particularly the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, people that are influenced by that mentality are just prone to naturally blame the Jews as the synagogue of Satan. I mean, after all, Jewish churches are called synagogues. It comes with it, the identification of the Jews, doesn't it? Yep. But what it's really representing is the rejection of Christ and the mixing of the holy with the profane. What did the Jews do? They mixed the pristine worship of God according to his ordinances, and they mixed with it the traditions of Babylon, the worship of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. You know, the holy trinity of Babylon was man, woman, and child. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yep. That's where we get the Trinitarian doctrine. It precedes Christianity. The women of, of 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 the temple were sitting on the steps of the temple, weeping for Tammuz. That was the ever virgin born son of the sun god Nimrod. I won't go through it all again. You know it's abomination. That's what God punished. That's what Daniel. Recon- recognized when he found himself in Babylonian captivity, he saw the sins of his people and he confessed. That system of, that synagogue of Satan continues in the Roman Catholic Church. The mixing of the holy with the profane. Okay. And, can, can and I ask? Uh... The Jews and the Roman Catholic Church have that both in common. That's what makes them the synagogue of Satan. Go ahead, Michael. Well, I just want to, uh, this might be uh, an overshoot, but I, I'm going to suggest, and I could be wrong about this, but the synagogue of Satan is anybody who denies that the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, that Jesus Christ was that the fulfillment. Couldn't have said it better myself. So, you know, when we're talking about what are the consequences of not understanding Daniel's 70th week, if you're buying into any of this stuff, this futuristic, this dispensational futuristic nonsense, I know this is a harsh statement to say, and I'm sure that most are not going to agree with me, and I could be wrong, but it seems to me that if you're buying into any of that, if you're part of any of that, you are part of the synagogue of Satan. You certainly stand at, at, at dire jeopardy of becoming part of the synagogue of Satan. No doubt about it. But God, see, I used to believe in this futurist lie. For 50 years of my life, I believed in it. 
But God extricated me from it, showed me from the scriptures what it's really all about. And that can happen for them, too, if they will, like Daniel, get on their faces and pray and confess their sin. God will reward them. God always rewards repentance. I've given up the traditions of men, the Babylonian traditions of men. I'm going to name them. I've given up Christmas and Easter and Sunday Sabbath. They all originated from ancient Babylon. They predate history. They're counterfeits, very weak counterfeits. They are mixing the holy with the profane. December 25th was anciently celebrated as the birthday of Tammuz. We know, all Christians even admit today, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. He was born in the fall. Most likely, people are hesitant to say this, but he was most likely born on the Feast of Tabernacles. He tabernacled with us, didn't he? He took on a temporary abode one fashion for him by the Father. That makes more prophetic sense, doesn't it? It's consistent with the official God-given feast days of Israel, the pristine worship of God. They were to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it points to Christ and no one else. Most Christian people will will admit now, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. That's just the day that was chosen. But they hesitate to tell you that that was the day always chosen by the Babylonish religion. December 25th, the birthday of Tammuz. It was celebrated the same way in in, in Medo-Persia, the same way in Greece. Now Rome. Jeremiah chapter 10 speaks of of, nothing else but the Christmas tree, and that was anciently practiced. There's no truth about Christ in anything called Christmas. Likewise, Easter. Anybody can research the origins of of Easter. Oh, yeah. And anybody can, can, can research the origins of Sunday Sabbath. And you'll find it's mixing the holy with the profane. And I came out of that. I repented of that, and God rewarded me. Where did he bring me? Daniel 9, 27. Yeah, so, can I say something here? Yes. Yeah, uh, you just took the words right off my mouth concerning Easter. Well, I always had my doubts about um, the date of Easter, that on Good Friday, as they call it, Jesus was crucified and uh, resurrect uh, Easter Sunday. My problem that I always had with that from a little child on was, why is Easter every year on another date? You know, when somebody dies, it's a date. He whether dies on the 1st of April or on the 2nd of March or on the 18th of March, I don't know. But that's the day of his death. And the day of uh, the death of Jesus, <clears throat> what every year change, that didn't make any sense to me at all. And I'm speaking about the time when I was still not a believer in this. So you can go on and uh, confirm me on this or, 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 or teach me on that, I don't know, but that was my understanding why Easter could not be the time that Jesus was crucified and three days later resurrected. Yes, well, Look, uh, there's been a controversy in the so-called Christian world for for nearly 2,000 years. I mean, the in the Greek church, that church that rose, remember when Constantine beat feet for, for Byzantium, I like to say? He left Rome, left his vestment, left his, his college of car, or rather his senate, left his, you know, left his abode. The restrainer left Rome and went to Constantinople, or Byzantium it was called, before it was called uh, Constantinople. There was a a, a Christian church that that he started there. He was a pagan all his life. Constantine was a pagan all his life. So was his mother. Uh, She was an an idolater. She was the one who went to Jerusalem, so-called got uh, the cross and... uh, Mary's milk, and I don't know what all. 
but but they started a church, and that church, that Eastern Church, it, they called themselves the Orthodox Church. They contended with the Pope, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, over the date uh, to be celebrated as Easter. That's what brought about the one of the one of the one of the things that brought about the the, the ultimate schism in 1054 A.D. between the Roman Church and the Eastern Church the Byzantium Church, or the Byzantine Christians. And uh, they still argue about it today. Well, right, well, they should argue about it, because God has nothing to do with it. Jesus has nothing to do with it. And uh, Sunday, the same thing. Uh, uh, There's no sanction in the Bible. There's no hint anywhere in the Scriptures that God who instituted the Sabbath on the seventh day of creation, would ever change it. Jesus made no mention of it. Jesus was criticized by the religious leaders of the day for picking corn on the Sabbath. What Sabbath was he keeping? His Father's Sabbath. That's the Sabbath we're to be keeping. And we know that when when Jesus came forth from the tomb, it says, the Scripture plainly says, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb to uh, uh, anoint Jesus' body, and the tomb, they found the tomb empty. And Jesus came to him and said, Touch me not, I have not yet ascended to my Father. That was on the first day of the week. So what was he doing on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week? He was in the grave. He'd risen. Yeah, but my point was just that every year, I, every, every time the Easter point? is changing, you know? That's so because that, it's it's the author of confusion. Yeah, but that's what I mean. That that is a re- that is that is the point that always made me not uh, believe in this uh, in, in the Jesus story. Oh yes. Robert Sanger, because oh. I thought when somebody dies, it's that day. Yeah, I mean, you go to a graveyard, and everybody everybody has two dates on their gravestone: the date of birth and the date of death. And uh, even though they uh, agreed on Christmas the 25th of December, that would be the date of birth, Jesus' birth, but I know it's not right, but that's not the point. Uh, there is a date fixed, but with Easter there is no date fixed because it always changes. It, some some years it's in March, some years it's in April. It has to do with the moon circle, I think, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct about that. So they are celebrating or, or remembering the day of Jesus' death and three days later his resurrection every year on another day. Yeah. Uh, on another date, and that is just not logical to me. That, that yeah. was the point that I was making. And and how are we instructed in the scriptures to remember that? Not the not, the, the, ordin- the ordinance the ordinance of of the Lord's table. This do in remembrance of me. There's nothing said about Easter. That's true. There's nothing hey. said about a holiday. He said, as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup. You do show forth the Lord's uh, uh, death until he comes again. That is our Easter. Every time, oh, gee, I retract that. (laughs) I find myself all the time using, returning to the abuse of the truth. Look, we don't celebrate Easter. That's that's Babylonianism, okay? Absolutely. That's Babylonianism. We are to remember Christ's crucifixion. We do that when we celebrate his table, the Lord's Supper. We do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Our salvation was through his death and sacrifice. We're to remember that. Easter is for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, I want you to go back to the topic. Yeah, that was a, that was the main, the main topic that main, I wanted to make too. Main, um, let's, let's let's go back to the, the subject at hand. You know, as far as the show today, we yeah, I've done your seventies week. Yeah, I, I have another point up there. Okay, um, I think it is also very uh, uh, interesting to read in that part, Luke twenty one verse twenty four. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Ah, and when is the time of the Gentiles fulfilled? 
Well, Daniel, we are told. Let me, let me yes, finish. go ahead. Go ahead. We are told that the times of the Gentiles will not end until Jerusalem is no longer ruled by other nations, and Jerusalem is now ruled by the Pope of Rome. When you look into the Oslo Accords of 1990. Yes, yes. Keep going, baby. No, that wasn't. <laughs> that, that was my they, they've always they've, they've been ruled by uh, Rome and other nations for two thousand well since almost two thousand years, right? I mean, as you know, we're, we're talking about the people now, right? The nation, and so when we look at the, what the, the what we see over there in the Middle East, that is just a it's just a counterfeit. It's just it's phony. It's not about it's not about a piece of dirt on in the Middle East. Um, to me, I think that this you know uh, they, they, uh, chapter twenty one verse twenty four uh, directly fits into uh, Daniel nine verse twenty seven as a completion to that because it's, it speaks about um, the destroying of Jerusalem, right? As mm-hmm. Tom was explaining all the time, uh, seventy mm-hmm. A.D. Yeah, and that's exactly what Luke twenty one twenty four speaks all about. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Well, that happened. Uh, that happened. Uh, led uh, captive to all nations. Remember, yeah. all and nations. Everyone should nations. remember that. All so nations. Jews are gathered, are, are spread around the whole world into all nations, yeah. and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. So that was 70 A.D. Yeah, and Until it doesn't say anywhere the in the Bible. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that they were going to come back and make a nation and remake a nation, a Jewish nation in the Middle East. Nowhere in the Bible says that. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> they were going to spread oh, throughout God. the land. So, but I want to go back to this, too. Is like If you look at Daniel 27, 927, how on earth can the majority of those quote-unquote Christians and whatever get the Antichrist out of it? Most people think there's actually talking about the Antichrist and not the Messiah, our mm-hmm. Lord and Savior. So, Tom, I just wanted to, you know, to talk a little more about how that happened. Why do most people actually believe that it's actually talking about the Antichrist and not our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's a good question, and I'm ready with the answer. Rome, these futurists have already taught, also taught, that in verse 26, where it says, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, acknowledging that it was that it was Titus of the Roman 10th Legion that destroyed the city and the sanctuary, but, but, that, that, but this is the Antichrist of the future will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's after he causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the, they, they say the prince that shall come is the Antichrist. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the following verse, and it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many at the midst of the week, cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. So they mean this is the Antichrist being spoken of here. And he is the Antichrist. will confirm a covenant, that's a seven-year peace treaty. In the midst of the week, he'll cancel that treaty, cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease, and war will break out. Okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but look. And Jerusalem but, will be trodden down for the second time, and that's why they try to gather all the Jews in that Israel country there. Yeah, really. Because then they can finally annihilate them from the world. Absolutely. That's just what I was going to say, Yerk. You're right on board. Really, the, the modern nation state of Israel, which is not sanctioned by God, was created by Rome yeah, to, to be, to be the, the answer to the final Jewish question. It's a but concentration they, camp, that's all. Yeah, it's a concentration camp for the Jews. That's all it is. It's just whatever they, what they failed to accomplish completely during the Second World War and the Holocaust, they intend to fulfill in, in, in the modern nation state of Israel. And if they can't destroy them physically through this constant battle with the Palestinians in the whole Arab world, if they can't annihilate the Jews by the hand of the Muslims, 
then they will simply cause them to eat and drink damnation to themselves through another sacrifice, another animal sacrifice. They're just as dead, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> so it, the whole creation of Israel is for the destruction of anyone who calls himself a Jew. Okay, now let me explain your previous question. How do they get the Antichrist, uh, the he, the second word of Daniel 9.27, the last verse of this prophecy, and he? How do they identify the he as the Antichrist? Well, first of all, they rejected it, that Jesus was the he. So it's got to be somebody else. And I've lost my train of thought here. Oh, now, now they say the prince that shall come is the he spoken of. The the prince that the prince that shall come in verse twenty six is the he spoken of in verse twenty seven. But that cannot be. Look what it says, and it says, and the people of the prince that shall come. It was the people of Prince Titus who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. The prince that shall come is not the object of that parenthetical phrase. The people are the subject of that parenthetical phrase. And rules of grammar dictate that if it relates to the people, then the second word of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the next verse should say, and they shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. You see, so their futurist interpretation of Daniel 9, 26, and 27 is conflicting with itself. It's grammatically incorrect to say that the he in verse 27 refers to the prince that shall come, when indeed the subject of that is the people of the prince that shall come. I got that from Nicholas Arthur from across the border, and it opened my eyes. It opened my eyes. Not that they were completely blind until I understood this. I was catching on to this. But I had to ask the same question that Michael asked. How do they get the he in verse 27 to be the Antichrist? And how do you confirm that it was Jesus and not the future Antichrist spoken of in this verse? Simply by understanding that he doesn't represent people. And it can't represent the prince that shall come. Because the prince that shall come is not the subject. It's the people. Did I explain that or not? Um, I don't know. How do you feel about <laughs> you explain it? I mean, I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. You know, the thing is, I'm still... Actually... I'm not confused about the fact that when I read nine, uh, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, that it's talking about uh, my Lord and Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, yeah. I'm still baffled. I mean, I know you've made a valid attempt to, uh, to explain why uh, the rest of the world sees an Antichrist, yeah. but I, I'm, still, I'm still baffled by it. it doesn't make, the only thing I can think of is that because they've been constantly bombarded indoctrinated by their pastors and their religious yeah. leaders that it's something other than, and then they're reading Bibles that have taken out the Messiah, the, the word the Messiah, out of this prophecy that they have been led into believing that it is uh, that uh, the Antichrist. Yeah. But if one reads the King James Version or earlier, you know, like he, you're going to come to this realization that it is not about the Antichrist, it's okay. about the Messiah. I, I, see, I see where I made my mistake. Okay. I explained that verse 27 is not talking about the people, uh, uh, not talking about the prince. If it refers to anything in that phrase, it has to be talking about the people. And the word he does not fit the people of the prince. So it must, it must refer to the Messiah, which it says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Yeah. You see, if, not, if it can't refer to the prince that shall come, and it cannot, it must refer to the people. We know it can't refer to the people, so it must refer to Messiah. There are three things talked about here. Messiah, 
the people, and he. If, right. it, if the he in verse 27 doesn't refer to the people, then it must refer to Messiah. And it does. It could just, just leave out the confusing part, this, this parenthetical fra- uh, clause, and just read it this way. And after three score and two weeks, in other words, after the 69th week, shall Messiah be cut off. And he shall confirm the covenant. Why? Because he was cut off. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall be cut off, cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. You see how easy this gets? Yes. <laughs> you also have to consider that they are not teaching from the KGV, but probably from the NIV or other Bibles. It's true. Most likely, and I was, yes, yes. I was just looking up uh, Daniel nine twenty six and 27 in the NIV. And when you read that, it has a whole un- whole other understanding. They can take a messiah out of it. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, I can read it to you, 26 and 27, if you like, and then we can see the changes that they made about there. Okay. Please after, do. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. And verse 27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. End quote. That's the NIV. Yeah. Do you, hey, Jorg, do you have that yeah. online? Completely in, different meaning. Uh, yeah, I can, I, can, I can put the link into uh, yeah. the PDF into the chat room. Yeah. If you don't mind. No, no problem. I just looked it up. You know, so. Or just send it to us. You don't have to put it in the chat room, but I guess there's... Oh, okay, too late. <laughs> in the chat room. <laughs> just to let you know, we're not supporting this. <laughs> uh, no, we we're don't. We're challenging it. We're but you challenging. know, the problem is that um, the teachings that all the people follow, all the so-called Protestants nowadays all over the world follow, are wrong teachings because all the Protestant churches, all the other harlots, let's say, are Jesuit infiltrated. Yeah. And all the priests and pastors that preach from the pulpits of those churches teach Jesuit uh, for, uh, spiritual formation because they have been visiting and they have been, um, uh, how can you say that, they have been taught in their seminaries Jesuitical teaching and not the right. real teaching from, from the KGB. You're, right. so, I, you're, yeah, I we are only trying to, uh, to interpret here the, the KGB, which is, which is of, course the, uh, of course the right word of God, but we don't take into account that all the people are betrayed because they don't even follow the KGB anymore. They are listening, and, uh, listening to, to other Bibles right. where you're, the word of God is corrupted. You're, yeah. I have a question for you now. Since you brought yeah. that up, yeah. who is the he? Based on, not on your understanding, but if you are just a Somebody is coming new to this, and you read that. Who would you figure? I mean, who would be the he in those two verses? Who would you think would be it? Not knowing what you know now, but if, just act like you are completely ignorant about the truth of this. What? What? How do you de- determine who the he is out of that? Uh, that's that's a very interesting question. Uh, I have to say, when I read this um, two verses here from the NRE, I do not make much sense out of it anyway, uh, especially because of after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death. Okay, the anointed one, then we can always um, uh, think, of course, this is Jesus Christ. But when they say they put this in the future, then they deny, actually, the first coming of Jesus Christ. Indeed. And that is the biggest flaw that I see in this. Because we are talking about this futuristic agenda about the so-called second coming of Christ. Where here they are talking about even the first coming of Christ in Daniel. That to me seems, uh, seems to be a big flaw in the, in the whole uh, system of thinking. Is. Because when they speak of the anointed one, the anointed one can only be Jesus Christ, at least as far, uh, as far as I understand it. So when you then turn to 
verse 27 and you say he will confirm a covenant, well, that's the same like in the KGV, where he refers to the anointed one in verse 26. Yeah, I mean, when you look at verse 26, you could, without, you know, the anointed one, that's such a vague statement. It really is. The anointed one. I mean, if it, you could make up anybody. It could be the Pope. Yeah. yeah of course, because he is the vicar of, uh, he is the vicar of Christ on earth. He is uh, Jesus uh, uh, hidden under the veil of flesh, as the Roman Catholic Church states. And people will and of say... Course, that, is, that is what they teach. So uh, if I was raised Catholic, I would probably think that the anointed one they talk about here is the Pope. Yeah, there you go. It's 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 such a vague statement that it could be anybody. Yeah. And it's well, well I'm, I'm most curious about the phrase uh, uh, and uh, the anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, if that is not an attack upon the the uh, upon the Christ Jesus Christ, and he shall have nothing. Do you know what he gained when he died? He gained all of us. He became the heir to the kingdom. And we joint heirs with him. I didn't even catch that. That's awful. That's an awful statement. Absolutely. It's a a wicked statement. It It certainly is. It's diabolical. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even notice that. That's a good good call in there. Yeah. (laughs) See, See their denial of Jesus? Yeah, I mean, they profess Jesus with their mouth, but they preach another Jesus, not the Jesus that died for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. They revel in that as a victory over Christ. Look at all the Roman Catholic churches. You see these emaciated bodies of Jesus hanging on the cross. It's just a celebration of their victory over him. And now it opens a stage for a, a phony refulfillment and a phony Christ. That's what it's all about. Yeah, uh, like a lot of other um, denominations out there state that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, but was just another prophet. So by denying the original Jesus Christ, of course, um, it fits their agenda in these forged Bibles, in these corrupted Bibles, to teach that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, never has come to this earth, but he will come in the future. Now you know why John Paul II, there's photographs of him anywhere you want care to look, of John Paul II kissing the Quran, and John Paul II kissing uh, Yasser Arafat. They deny Christ. They have that in mutual common. Yeah. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church is diabolical, and if the Roman Catholic pew-sitters would comprehend what the real agenda of their Roman Catholic hierarchy is, they would abandon that church. There are many people in the Roman Catholic Church who truly, as best they can, under all the deceptions that they are under, from cradle to grave, they truly do worship Jesus Christ. And that's why the command is to come out of that church before the plagues happen. That church is going to be plagued just like Pharaoh's Egypt was. They have to come out of that church. They have to come out from underneath the governments of, that the Vatican controls. That includes the United States government. Coming out of Babylon, does remember, the Vatican is a church and a state. It's a global church and a global state. That means they control all the churches and all the, the governments. We have to come completely out of that system. We can't remain in the church, and we can't remain in the state. I, I'm probably confusing the issue now, but there's much more to coming out of Babylon than coming out of just the Roman Catholic Church. Absolutely. You have to come out of the daughter churches and all sorts of things because there's so many layers of the Babylonian system that you have to address and deal with to come out of. So, But it's interesting is, look at that, it's not only the NIV, but the New Living Translation, uh, the English Standard Version, uh, the New American Standard, they're all saying the same thing. And Daniel 9, 26, and having nothing. And um, uh, I just, uh, 
I never noticed that until now, and how wicked that statement really is, so, and how belittling it is of our Lord and Savior. So, not only do they not mention the Messiah, but then they make it out, you know, that basically accomplished nothing. You know, it's a statement, I mean, having nothing, you know, so. Well, that's why you're not alone on this broadcast, but you have brothers to help you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. There's an, another question that goes along with Dan, Dan, what we're, we're talking about, and even what Jorg brought up as far as uh, Luke and Luke. Uh, this question's a tough one, and I know it's going to probably upset a few people, but it's a question that should be asked. And this question is: How can you be a Jew and deny Daniel nine twenty seven? How can you? Honestly, honestly, be, you know, if we, first of all, what is Jew? <laughs> and then if, if you are a Jew, how can you deny that? And I know that as part of the, the, what we know as a Jew today, the Jewish faith, that is encouraged to, and in fact, you know, you'd be cursed if you do read it. But, um, but okay. so we have to go back to the fundamental, we have to go back to the fundamental question is, yeah. How can you actually be a Jew and deny that? I mean, there's a but, giant contradiction going on here. Yeah, but that question you should have asked 2,000 years ago. Well, I wasn't there, so I'm asking it now. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to, to all the Jews living at that time and who denied Christ. Right. And that is probably because they also at that time have been infiltrated with false gospels and false, false teachings by their priests. That's the only answer that I can give, give to that because... When the Jews say that they live after the Old Testament, where Daniel was recorded in, and they lived after that, and they read after that, That's correct. here they had a perfect identification of Jesus Christ, of their Savior, and they all denied them. I know. It, few, it, 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 it baffles me. It's, it's, it, the contradiction is beyond comprehension, and I understand that they are strongly encouraged not to read that, but the same point... It's their their own Bible, and they should be read it, regardless of what their authority figures or the rabbis, which you should not be calling them in the first place, rabbi. Um, yeah, but you can say the same thing to Christians, and they only read the Roman Catholic Catechism and not the Bible itself. Well, I understand because that. If every Christian, if every Christian would read the Bible as it was meant to be, and they were presented the right Bible, the KGV, like we do our study on then we wouldn't have this confusion in the world right now that we are having. Well, no, but this, I guess when it comes down to this, the question is, are we the Jews? Because no, we, we believe that? that? I mean, I'm asking this. This is an honest question. I'm not trying to be controversial. The answer is simple. The answer is simple. It's given to us right in the Scriptures. One is not a Jew who is circumcised of the flesh. One is a Jew who is circumcised of the heart. heart. Yeah. Abraham, Abraham was a Jew, a true Jew, before he was circumcised. Abraham was a true Jew before he was circumcised. Paul plainly said, one is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but one who is a Jew inwardly. That is one of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The ones who received Jesus Christ as their Savior are the true Jews. Well, that's what I'm getting. So that's, I mean, salvation, you... salvation is not by DNA. Right. So you know, if you look at what you're just saying, what I'm asking the question, you know, this, this question, I, it, it, to me, when logically, as you read this, you study the Bible, you study history and everything, if you're a true believer of Jesus Christ, if you really believe and understand that, you know, Daniel 9.27 is talking about our Messiah, Jesus Christ, and that it was fulfilled 2,000 years ago, uh, we're the Jews, and the people that are being called Jews in the Middle East, I know this could be real controversial, but the people in the Middle East really aren't the Jews. We're no, the Jews. they reject Jesus. They still reject. Now, many, many of them are converting to true Bible Christianity. I've come to realize that. Many people are testifying that the, 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 the genetic Jews in Israel today are hearing the gospel. Right. And they are receiving their Messiah, Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled this prophecy 2,000 years ago. They are true Jews, Jews of the heart, and not and their circumcision availeth them nothing. They are like we are, 
And, uh, uh, but, but the nation of Israel is wholly apostate. I mean, if they want to return to a temple and animal sacrifices, clearly defines them as the synagogue of Satan. Yeah. They're working with the Vatican. That's why the government of Israel works so closely with the Vatican. The, Vat- the Vatican achieves her objectives always in, in the modern nation state of Israel. The Vatican now has an enclave, an enclave, uh, within the old city of Jerusalem. It's, it's essentially a Vatican within, uh, it's a sovereign city-state within the old city of Jerusalem. And the Vatican, uh, as, as we, we know, the Oslo Accords, mm-hmm. and, and also the testimony of uh, Barry Chamish and uh, Joel Bainerman, that 33rd degree Freemason Shimon Perez deeded Temple Mount to the Vatican secretly. The Vatican holds the deed to Temple Mount. What do you suppose the Pope wants to do as being the sovereign over Temple Mount? It fits with the futurist interpretation of this prophecy. Correct. It, it's, everything's focusing on Jerusalem and the Temple Mount because the Vatican's got to fulfill this futurist, this futurist counterfeit of the 70th week of Daniel. And it's all happening right before our very eyes. But they are not Jews. They are of the synagogue of Satan. And I would not refer to real Bible-believing Christians who understand Daniel, 7, uh, Daniel 9, 26, 27, and the other verses that you just read as the real Jews. I would refer to them as the real Israelites. Or, the, or, or, or as it says in the Bible, the real Jews, too. I mean, it's whatever you want to refer to. But the fact of the matter is, well, you know, Israel, you know, to call yourself been, calling yourself a Jew and actually being a Jew are two different things. Uh, Israel has been reduced only to the Jews, and Israel are twelve tribes, right? And they were all through the Old Testament, uh, uh, except from the time they became apostate and were captive in Babylonia and, uh, and other stuff. Uh, they were the real followers of God, <clears throat> and as long as we are the real followers of God, we are the new Israel. Right. Well, I guess my point being is that when we see what we see over in the Middle East in this creation from the Jesuits and from the Vatican of the state of Israel and the people that are calling themselves Jews, we should even question that that if that's even the truth. Because if they are true Jews, especially as Tom has mentioned, especially in the spirit at some point, they're going to have to come to the realization, and this has nothing about being a Christian or not, because I can, we can argue about reading the label of a Christian, but someone who's a true follower of the Messiah, a true follower of the Torah and the, 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 the Old Testament, you have to come to realization at some point, if one is intellectually honest, that the Messiah did show up 2,000 years ago, and that Messiah is Jesus Christ or Yahshua, and if you're denying that, I, I, I just to, to call themselves Jews is is a contradiction in itself. Well, the real Israelites of today accept the Old and the New Testament, and that's the problem with the Jews that you always call because they don't accept the New Testament. Right, and, it, and the New Testament talks about this too. This whole thing of the, it's, it's a valid t- discussion even today. It was even in Paul's time. He was figuring this up too, you know. You know, how can you be a Jew and deny Christ? How can you deny Jesus Christ? There's a there's a giant contradiction going on here, and it needs to be addressed. But it, it's not when I I'm bringing this up, I'm not attacking anybody, any particular group. I'm just saying, you, it's like saying that you're, um, let's say you're a, a Greek Orthodox Russian. But you actually live in Brazil and you are a Catholic. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. The facts don't back it up. Well, the fruits you shall know them. So maybe I'm wrong, you know, but I mean, it's just, just the way I'm looking at it now, it just doesn't make any sense. We're paying homage to a group of people that aren't even what they say they are. We're, you know, we're supporting this whole. Contrivance, this whole yeah, delusional that's the point that's fantasy. To make when he said the, uh, he's not a Jew who is outwardly a Jew, but who is inwardly, and circumcision comes with the heart. Right. That's yeah. one of the biggest points that Tom makes about that point about being a Jew. I think. 
Yeah. And I think it's something that we should address and, and bring up. I mean, it's what we're doing now, I guess. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it's been a very good show, Tom. I, I'm, hopefully, that we we stayed on on target here and on, on, on topic. <laughs> we didn't take too far away from it, but uh, well, let me was, just let me let me just wrap it up by saying this. Okay. What what we see going on in in Israel today is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. I've, that sounds ridiculous to people that don't understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy 2,000 years ago. If they understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of this entire prophecy 2,000 years ago, it's over, it is finished, the seal, the scroll has been real, rolled up, the seal has been placed upon it, no one has the authority to open that seal and rewrite that, that prophecy. It's over, the vision is over, it's no longer about the Jews. It's no longer about Israel. It's no longer about the Messiah. It's all been fulfilled. Christ has come. He redeemed us. He stopped the sins. He opened the gates of heaven for anybody who would receive him. And what's going on in Israel today is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And it is going to claim the souls of billions with a B. Billions. Thank you, Tom. By the way, I really do appreciate this show. I appreciate the time you spent with me, Tom, explaining what's going on there and the, <clears throat> you know, the whole motives behind uh, the creation of the state of Israel. Uh, I thank you for explaining the consequences of not understanding Daniel 9, verse 27, because it is very dire. It's very dire what's going on there. And the majority of people are buying into this delusion, this fantasy, this creation of the of Rome in the Middle East, and investing a lot of their time, money, um, and etc. into it. And um, you know, it, it, to me, it's very heartbreaking. I, you know, even before I, I surrendered to the Lord. I looked over there in the Middle East and said, you know, whatever's going on there, it cannot be of God. It, it is wacky. It doesn't make any sense. The contradictions are overwhelming. And uh, to just to, to have folks like you uh, are willing to uh, share your insights to help to understand what's really going on, the real motives behind it is really important. So I hope people that, that listen to, who are listening to this now and into the future will understand. Um, and it, sounds, it feels and sounds like we're about to wrap up here in the show. So uh, the other thing too, folks, Saturday, uh, Tom mentioned his name already today, uh, Nicholas Arthur will be on. And we're going to go through the first chapter of his book called The Vatican. As Vatican moves on Temple Mount, I think it's going to go hand in hand with what we talked today, and I think it's really important that we understand the actual truth, the real motives behind the Middle East. What's going on in this "quote unquote" state of Israel, and why we should not be a part of it? That we should expose it for what it is, and warn people about it and the great delusion that, that uh, it is, the great deception that it is. So, uh, I don't know, gentlemen, do you have any final words before we, uh, either one of you, uh, before we close? I just want to say that uh, in the first broadcast that Tom made on the subject, he said he will start reading uh, verses 24, 5, 6, and 7 of Daniel 9, and that he actually wanted to read the whole chapter of Daniel 9. And I'm looking forward to inviting Tom another time when he has the time to do that and to take us through the whole chapter 9 of Daniel. The confession? To better Daniel's confession. To, to, yeah, the, Daniel's confession, Daniel's prayer, to even better understand the last verses that we have been uh, now broadcasting on about for four hours up to now. Sure. If Tom wants to, that's fine. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> well, I'll do it, but I'll tell you, it's gut-wrenching. And I don't know if I'll be able to maintain my composure, because I never do when I read it. 
But uh, and I don't want people thinking I'm just going to be doing this to to express my emotionalism. This is something that goes right to the marrow of my bones. What Daniel prayed is should be the prayer of every Bible believing heart today. That's why it's so important that you struggle. Oh, the error of Christianity today is the same error that the Jews committed: the mixing of the holy with the profane, and when. God opened your eyes to the apostasy, the Babylonish traditions of men that have, that have literally become Christianity today. This prayer, this confession of Daniel would just tear your heart out. And uh, uh, I don't even know why I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to this, because it's, it's a gut-wrencher for me. Well, I'll, 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 I'll do it again, but, but only if, with your indulgence. Uh, but uh, I'll just con- I'll just conclude the way I always conclude with a blessing, blessing from the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease two thousand years ago. That's who I want my listeners to be blessed by. The one who came 2,000 years ago and caused the sacrifice and oblations to cease. There is no more sacrifice or oblation. It's Christ or none. See you next time. Amen, brother. Thank you. Thank you, York. And uh, hopefully we have uh, another show coming up soon with York uh, in Conversation Juggler 66. Um, our last show was... A powerful one as well. So, uh, Tom in New York. So, anyway, Saturday. What's given you have uh, uh, Nicholas Arthur? We talking more about this subject with him. That'd be 9:30 p.m. Saturday Eastern. So, thank you, Tom. Thank you, York. And with that, folks, I'm gonna call it a show. It was an excellent one. With that, so thank you. <laughs>